Hello and welcome to another edition here on Fifty Bouncing TV, where we have the sensible conversations, interesting chats all the time. And today we're veering a bit into sports as well. That's what we do. We do everything: uh, conversation, sports, politics, social matters, all here on Fifty Bouncing TV. Let me also say this to you: that we'll start showing the series escapades right here on Fifty Bouncing TV very soon. You're going to see the promo running. It's going to be showing on particular days. Escapades was one of the very beautiful series on television that you ever, ever, ever saw. If you missed it, this is the time to watch it on 50 Bands on TV right here. We'll tell you exactly when, how you can watch it. Go to YouTube and subscribe to this channel, 50 Bands on TV. You see the red button on the right side of your screen. Just click on it and subscribe. And you will be getting notifications of all our content that we put there every time. Welcome aboard. And let's enjoy this conversation. Today, I'm speaking to somebody who many regarded as one of the best gentlemen in the world of football. As far as the Black Stars were also concerned, he was one of the neatest strikers. I mean, that accolade can never leave him. <laughs> A guy born in Takrade at the time, he played for Boise Goldfields. Then he played for uh, soccer missionaries. You know, he's, he's been around. And then, of course, he went into a surgeon, played in Switzerland, played in Germany, played in Turkey, played in Portugal. He's, he's moved around the world. He's one of Ghana's very respectable old players, the legend of our time. And he's my very, very, very good friend and guest on this show. His name is Augustine. Augustine. Good to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. We've done this many times. We've done a lot of <laughs> stuff together um, and, and all of that. People want to know some of the things that you've been through, the experiences and the conversations. But let's start off with life as a former footballer. Yeah. I mean, you're one of the most recognized faces of our football. How is it like to be retired? Thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, I've been watching you on that. I think it's going well. Let's pray that you can extend your, your feathers further. We can uh, find our tie and dye business. <laughs> yes, uh, life after football. I think uh, it's been interesting and challenging at the same time because uh, once you are playing, you, I don't think you even think that one day <laughs> you will be done with football. Yeah. And so as you play and uh, enjoy being a footballer, active one at that, sometimes you forget to understand that one day you'll be home and then other things have to fall in play. So it's been interesting, challenging. It's also been educative. Mm -hmm. And so it's an opportunity to advise the young ones coming up so that uh, they might not encounter situations like some of us have encountered going forward. You went to school. Yes. I mean, you went to GSDS for that matter. You are a sixth former. Um, how how different is it to be a, an educated footballer from somebody who is... I mean, you played with other guys who were also not into school, but pure talent. How How is it like when you look at those who have been to school, the lifestyle and football, and look at those who haven't, lifestyle and football? How would you, what would you say about that? I wouldn't want to go back. I mean, if I say back, refer to the likes of footballers who played from the 60s, 70s and all that. But the current crop of players, let me. I think when you are, you've been to school before, you are able to understand that there are certain parameters in life that you need to uh, more or less store in case uh, you are done with football. And so you think of investment, you think of uh, making life comfortable for your immediate uh, family. Mm. And then if you've not been to school, some in our local parlance, we call it the mm. Some have what it takes to manage their lives. Some don't. And uh, I think most of us have fallen prey, prey to uh, the, the, the latter. And so uh, I would say that as footballers and sportsmen, we should begin to think about our end, which is at the tail end of your playing career, from the beginning. Mm so that you don't encounter issues uh, when <laughs> the time catch, catches yeah. up with you. When, when you started your career, at what point did you start thinking about investment? Hmm. Strangely, when I went to Europe, 
I met because uh, you were coming from a background of football. Yeah, your father played for Hazakes, yes. your brother Tony Ahimfo. Yes. You know, so you were coming from a football background, and you had seen the examples. Yes. You know, at what point did you start thinking? You know, my, my father played football and also was he retired. I think I think as a chief post superintendent at Gapoa in mm. Agadi, and so you can say that he was a senior officer within the port services, but he never even had a, a house of his own. My mom growing up was like a trader in Takradi. So there was this area in Takradi called Energy Estate. Yeah, energy. It was a new uh, enclave that was being developed where estate houses were being built. Can you imagine that my mom bought a house there and my father asked her to sell? Why? I don't know, maybe typical Fantima. He didn't understand why the wife was going to own a property while she was in active service. I remember my mom bought a car in Takradi. It was a Toyota, I remember. The number was 1990. Hmm. He asked my mother to sell that one too. Because my mom was a business, also a baker. My sisters, all of them were involved in the business. I'm saying it because though he played football to the highest level, he never had a uh, property. So when I first went to Europe, I remember when uh, Dot One gave me up for loan to Grasshoppers. There's this man who has lived in Ghana all his life. He's a Swiss. Mm. He used to be the managing director of Akoso Motors, mm. mm. Esposito. Is Esposito. Yes. Mm. The manager of Grasshoppers and him were friends. Mm. So I think he told him that there is a Ghanaian coming to our club and I want you to host him for a while. So it was him who picked me up from the airport. I stayed with him for like a month, <clears throat> though I was playing for Grasshoppers. And I remember him telling me, Augustine. And that is the way he mentioned Augustine. Don't invest in any business that you see liquid money. So I was like, what is liquid money? He said, where you see money every day. If you like, just buy properties here and there or buy some lands, make sure you secure them with your documents. Don't even invest that much in Takradi. That is his advice. But immediately I thought, ah, what is this man say, singing to me? Because one day we'll be done with football. Mm. And so one needs to start preparing himself for, for, for that time when he arrives. So he advised me, but I did not go with the advice that he gave me. You didn't understand what he was I practicing. didn't really understand, Fifi. Because along the line, issues happened. I was once a key distributor for Unilever Nestle. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the key distributors in Ghana, mm -hmm. the whole of Ghana, our area of supply was that huge from Weja all the way to our pump to the Suedro area and Borgias area. My company was supplying. But this is where the liquid money was. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't here. I was playing football outside. My wife never took keen interest in that because she also had her own business. So I felt that, okay, fine. Let's employ a manager and people that will run the business, including my lawyer who was involved. But at the end of the day, what happened? They collapsed the business totally to the extent that I, need, I had to lose properties to that aspect of my life. And then it came to remind me, oh, Esposito told me this. Hmm. I never really understood him then because he said, if you like, save your money at the bank. When you are sure of stopping football at any time, then you can come sit home and plan what to do. But as you man be at ah, for all this for 15 years playing house, I'll save all the money. Let me invest the money into something so that by the time when I'm done with How much did you put into that business? I can't really recall, but it's a lot of money because I remember when the problem came 2005, thereabout. So I went to Stanchard to reconcile the monies that I had given it. I mean, out mm. for the purposes of the business. At the time, it was around $380,000 then. Mm. 2005, yes, 2006. 2005, 2000, thereabouts. Just to reconcile, because there was this particular person that I was sending the monies to. And so I always wrote a letter. I had an offshore account. Mm. So I always wrote a letter, a fax then, because the internet was not like this mm. today. So I, I, I was I write a letter, please release an amount of money like $50,000 to, let's say, 50 bands mm. for so-so and so-and-so. I just find something and then, please, uh, counting on you as usual. And then I, I had this account manager at the back, Mr. Smart Abbey, he was a retirement man. Mm. 
So I will, I will copy him and I'll call him that I've sent you. So this guy goes there and then he physically gives him the money. Because we had established an overdraft facility mm -hmm. with the bank. Mm -hmm. And my wife then was not happy about it. I wasn't happy. But I told her, oh, the value of the property was that much. Mm -hmm. And the overdraft we were looking for was this. And so I'll be able to clear it almost immediately. So the thought of bringing the money was to stop using the overdraft. Unknowing to me, all the monies that I sent, they were not using for the purpose. So they were basically going to the bank for additional overdraft. So the initial overdraft that I knew about was currently, you say, 15,000 cities. At the time, it was 150 million then, mm. 2000, 2001. Mm. They took additional 12 overdrafts without my knowledge. Meaning that all the monies that I was bringing, they were not using for the purpose. And the bank sat down and allowed this thing to happen. And this was somebody you trusted? Yes. I mean, even my lawyer, PV. And I've mentioned his name on a program. And he threatened to sue me. And I was grateful that he said that because that is what I was looking for. You know, when the company requests for additional overdraft or whatever. There is this agreement that the bank gives you. We call it an offer letter. Yeah. So the bank gives you an offer letter. And in the contract that governs the overdraft, I didn't even know that two directors of the company should assent to or sign mm. for the offer letter. Too. So each time they requested for additional overdraft, the bank brought them an offer letter. And the lawyer and the managing director then signed for the company. And the money was disbursed or given to them. Unknowing to me. So all along, I felt that... Were, they, were there two of them directors to the company? Yes, they were. Because when I was in the company, because I was not going to be... I was not a signatory to the account. My wife wasn't. But the property use was my myself. So, so after the overdraft, they couldn't pay back to the bank? And that's yes, that basically, yeah, overdrive is supposed to, it's not supposed to stay for long. Yes. It's for a period. Yes, a short period. Yes. So if you keep on going to them to give you additional overdraft and they are giving it to you, one, it is either the relationship officer of the bank is benefiting somewhere mm -hmm. or a manager of the bank is probably also benefiting because they knew that Augusta Info was the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. I was not in the country. They had all my telephone numbers. In Turkey. And yet they couldn't even call you call one me. day to cross check if there is it was one you. man that I met who was the, I think, the corporate head of uh, the bank, mm. Trust Bank mm. at the time. Mm. And that's it. And he told me that each time they came and requested, he just asked them to bring receivable, receivable books, uh, whatever books, mm. and then everything was. I said, but they could, have, could be lying to you then. Yeah. You had all my numbers. Just give me a call. Augustine, these people have come for additional. Should we give it to them or not? But you kept giving it to the one, not two, not three, not four, not five. Thirteen additional overdrafts without my knowledge. And guess why I got to know? Because the business was doing so well in the area. A company called CCTC. Mm. They were supplying yeah, rice. rice. Yeah. They approached my company. And our base was in Kansas. So they wanted us to deal with them. But they wanted us to lift products for like three months. If we're able to lift like three billion worth, which is 300,000 cities, then they will not ask us to bring money, but rather our bank should just give us a guarantee. So that more or less like a credit. Yeah. Person. Within a month, we had sold more than the three billion. So they said, no, okay, now don't lift with cash again. We want your bankers to give you a guarantee. The bankers refused. And I was in Turkey. It was almost in December. I was about to come. So why was the bank not giving the guarantee? Because that business, the initial amount of money we needed to lift, I sent it personally, 800 million then, which is currently 80,000. Mm. I sent it from my own uh, accounts at the Stancher. And that money was used. And within whatever, we were able to turn it around. So why is the bank refusing to give that? It's okay. I'm coming on vacation. When I came and I went to the bank, there's a problem and what what problem that was when they told me 
that your people had come for additional work. I, I am tempted to mention the no, process, no, but I don't okay. want to. Yeah. So how could you have done that? Without and and what explanation did they give you? He said, oh, that's only what I said before, that all the books that they asked them to bring for him to see were in good. So when you confronted the two other directors, what did they say to you? Ah. The first man, the first one was the managing director. So I asked, what's going on? He said, oh, all the monies are not lost. They are in debt. Okay, so then bring, bring us the debt. Let's re reconcile. So we had immediate emergency meeting. We checked, and at the time, the money with it, it was so much. I said, okay, fair. Then we are able to recover. We'll be able to. Then we, I was here, so physically we're going to the people, and then when you go, he says, they are paid. When you go, they are paid, they are paid, they are paid. And so indeed, he was in the truth. So he was arrested by the police. And then we realized that he was putting up a building in Kaswa. <clears throat> And guess what, Fifi? Where he was putting up his building here, the next plot of land, which is, I think, about a four plots of land in one, was for the corporate affairs manager who was in charge of our account. So all they did was they milked you dry. Yeah. And, I, I, and, and you ask yourself that a banker who had explained to me that, Augustine, we have all some customers, but this is what you are supposed to do. He advised that we opened over that facility. He the banker advised because one at the time the only bank in Kaswa was Trust Bank, an international commercial bank. That one was in me, so we chose Trust Bank. I wanted Stan Chat, my bankers, to be in charge, but they said they could not go all the way to Kaswa to go and bring the money to their right office. So we approached Trust Bank and it was open. And he advised Augustine, this business, you know, in the nature of the business, you never necessarily, if your company signed checks, are there with them. You sign an open check, they are there. So the asset when? Every week or so, when they load you a 40-foot container worth of goods, the figure in there, they put it on check and send it to your bank. Meanwhile, you are yet to receive the goods and sell them to your customers. And they expect you to give to your customers for like two weeks, three weeks before you start recovering. Yet you have paid upfront. So there's pressure on the key distributors. So the bank advised that, look, when your check comes and you have not, because we know, you are yet to receive the goods to sell. So if it comes like that, then the bank will rely and then pay on your behalf. So when you sell and recover, you come, we take our interest. Mm -hmm. and then, if you are sitting there running your business, you will not. But the people knew that I was not here. And the lawyer who signed those offer letters, when the bank took the company to court, I wasn't part, my wife was not part. But the document that was used to secure the overall had Augustine and Barbara in front. The bank, I don't know how, had been able to approve the overdraft without the consent of my wife. One year after, they realized that the document had Augustine and Barbara. So they gave a consent letter to this individual, took it to the house, unknown to my wife. She signed. And the lawyer knew that my wife had not consented to the original overdraft. So he used that as a trump card. So when the bank took the company to court, guess what he did? He now came in with something called interpleader or something. Mm. I'm not a lawyer, but that's the word I remember. Using my wife, that her name was on the document, but she did not consent to over that being given. The bank allowed that. My wife was called into the box and she testified. It's true. My wife had never been to trust bank before then. But they had that consent that she had sent. Yeah. At the tail end, I remember vividly where I was sitting behind the lawyer in court and the trust bank lawyer pulled the consent and showed it to my lawyer. He did like this. I didn't know why he did like that. So then the man presented to the judge that my lord, this woman who is here and they, 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 this is a consent that she's, and they just carved it in a way that they even said that my wife came to the bank and signed it. Because her signature was yeah. there. And then so when the judge saw the thing, then the thing has changed completely. Because I wasn't party to the suit. My wife wasn't party to it. But he had pulled my wife in. Into the knowing very well that he himself had signed. And all this I didn't know Vivi. So when the judge gave his ruling, then he said, <laughs> a lawyer who played a multifacilitated role in acquiring all this overdraft 
comes to stand in the courtroom to defend the same company. And I was like, ah, is it that I don't understand English again? What is this that say? Then he gave his ruling. And because of that, whatever we have filed was thrown away. Thrown away. Then he said we should go for an appeal. So he suggested another lawyer. He charged me. Then 75 million. The same person. The same person suggested another lawyer. The lawyer came in, wrote to the court as a new solicitor in the matter. So he was looking for the judgment to read through. I had given him 5,000, which is 50 million there. A day or two later, he called me. Early morning, Augustine, please pass by the office before you go anywhere. And I'm so okay. So, oh. He gave it, just read that. I took it. I was reading and reading and reading. My face was changing. The judge had given to the lawyer in there. I said, ah, but no. I called him, no. He said, yes, he was part. I don't even know why he went to stand in for you. He should have stood outside. And look for another lawyer because he himself signed the document. So, so, okay, so how did you recover? Because you lost your property, right? Oh, yes, not one. You lost two uh, properties yeah. to the bank. Yes, to the bank. To the bank. Now, they, 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 they did you agree with the bank that they oh, take even, the property? In okay, place? okay. The bank had had gotten a judgment against us based on the first mistake the lawyer made. But then the new lawyer went to court and challenged the same judge. Or pleaded. And my Lord, August and Barbara, if we are not party to the seat, so why do you want to attach the property as a security? And the judge ruled against the bank. The same judge who had ruled against the company said, Yes, August and Barbara are not party to the seat. They are not even signatories. So the bank cannot attach their property. So guess what they did? They went back to court. They waited almost like a year. I had gone back to take it somewhere 2007. And they made a publication with the previous judgment they have made and published it. So now they are suing me and my wife as the owners of the business and use the previous judgment. Attached. So he went back to court. And it was before the current immediate, I mean, the recently announced Chief Justice. She sat on that case. She was a high court judge. Was it true that the banks threw you out of your house? No, I, I, I needed to, to move out because at the time they had gone behind. All in this in this period, I was paying them. I was paying because I knew that eventually, because of the mess that had been committed. So I was paying. I was paying to the standard. I paid over four hundred thousand cities to them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether I was by it was supposed to happen that way for something else, I don't know. They were just bent on taking the properties. Because I remember the judge telling them that, look, I'm not going to rule on this matter, but I expect the bank and the gentleman to sit. So, Mr. Info, please give them proposals. First proposal, rejected. Second proposal, rejected. Third proposal, rejected. Fourth proposal. So I said, okay, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do. So I just ignored whatever was mm. supposed to happen eventually. Now, the two houses that you lost were both in Accra? No, one in Accra, the one in Accra. Is it one of the most regrettable investments that you made? Of course, why not? It's not only that one. There's another company, aluminium company, same, same story. And the same lawyer and the same person that I was sending the money to were involved. Because is it a case of you trusted them too much? I think for or me, or you, did, or you didn't learn the lessons of the previous. No, it, the business was the same around the same time. It so was around the same you time. realized they had done you in in yes. both companies. A whole aluminium company. We were just two owners. Zebra Aluminium Company Limited was the name. Myself and my partner. The partner was here managing the business. I was playing football. And then he did the same. My partner. It was, it was on the Smithers Road. After Papa here, you go to where the Capital Bank was. Mm. There was another company, and we for you. A whole aluminium company. Why should it collapse? Because I wasn't here. The mindset of some of us is something that we did. Do you have other footballers, I mean, some of your colleagues, who have also lost investments in that sense? I believe so. 
I believe so. If even when I was playing way back in Gophos, or Boise Gophos, this Piram thing came up. Yeah. And most of my colleagues invested. But I mean, I'm not that person. Piram was like men's gold. I don't so see why I have to put my money and at the end of the month get 10% or something percent. No, it's so good to be true. But most of my colleagues lost money. So this thing had happened before. We've all this current one that came. I don't want to mention the name. But life is there to teach us lessons. Mm -hmm. And so I have taken, I've learned a lot. I still do things for people openly. You know me. Mm -hmm. I don't hold back. I don't come to you because of money. No. I first want to offer my services to you. Whatever thereafter will come in mm -hmm. and, and we will enjoy. But when I come to you, I come genuinely with an open heart. Mm -hmm. I think that is also wrong because that is where the where trust comes in. This aluminum guy, for instance, some guy that knew me from Takwari was working with him and he was just coming to me. He was just saying, hey, my friend opened an aluminum business in spring test. He's looking for a partner. Guy. Somebody assembly that aluminum. You want me to? So for like a year or two, every time pestering me. So I came, I remember coming to that 2000. I was okay. Call the, tell the guy to call me. So he called me and we met specifically at the airport here. There was some restaurant yeah, the back. back there. So we met there. And he told me that he was looking for $38,000 as my equity, 50% equity, because the machines there were 10 different machines, were valued probably at 38000 So he was looking for physical cash mm -hmm. to buy the raw materials to feed. President Kufa had just taken office mm -hmm. in 2001, so things were actually tough for people. I said, okay. So I spoke to this same lawyer. So said, okay, so aluminum business is good. So let's visit the factory first and see. So the next day, we agreed and went to the factory. And the machines were there. So said, okay, so if you have money, just try and invest in it. Like, well, this is good. Right? 38,000. I went to Turkey. There was a rent that I was supposed to pay then. I remember 35 million then as rent for the warehouse. Immediately, $100,000. The thirty-eight thousand immediately I sent him hundred thousand dollars because if the business was good, then we needed enough cash to be able to lift from Aluex mm -hmm. because the circles for production is produced by Aluex. Mm -hmm. When you have your money, you go there, you cash, and then come and produce. Well, this cooking intensive. Yeah. Yes. And all of a sudden, the company, boom. But guess what? The woman that I was with, my wife, may I so rest in peace, intentionally went to the factory to get they call it a tray. Mm -hmm. Where those times our moms will be washing mm -hmm. in the Krasambo. Krasambo. Mm -hmm. She intentionally bought two, and our partner sold it to my wife. I did, was it. Did he know? He she, knew she my was wife. Your wife. Yes. So I was in taking my wife called. Hey, hmm. Alote. He called, she calls me. Alote. Show me you. Show me you. What is it? Ah, the guy here where this guy that burned. My shit that I caught He didn't know that he took money from me. I said, ah, but his business. So if your husband has invested in it, so he has to give it for free. Look how foolish I was. But come to think of it, I think he could have given it to my wife as a souvenir. Yeah. That this is what your husband brought. And this is what we are producing out of the money he brought. So you take it and try it and see if there's any you can come and buy. But I rather I was fighting with the woman. That because your husband took money, he has to, no, 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 no way. This is business. You see, you come in the market. The rest is history. She was like a prophet to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but in all the businesses that you lost, mm -hmm. were you consulting her? Because she seemed to be the kind of person who was giving you that kind advice. Of advice. Okay. Were you consulting her before those businesses? Uh, let me take it from uh, the A and B, which is the uh, Unilever. Uh, yeah. The company was A and B Target Supermarket. Augustine and Barbara, A and B. I told them, because when I was approached about that opportunity, I went to, I remember it was a Sunday. I told oh, Charlie, these people brought this, I think, which is good. So maybe tomorrow, tomorrow, next, before I go back to Turkey, we'll have to go and register a company. So this is the name I am thinking of using, because Augustine and Barbara, A and B. So I don't think she would, Say that I did not inform her. 
Also, the same thing to the aluminium guy. That's how can she was able to go there. Mm. But you see, you have to. One thing that she always kept telling me was that I have to be very careful because I trust people so much. I trust people so much. So I have to be very careful with people. At the, at the moment, as a retired footballer, how do you live? How oh, do you survive? I am, I am okay. I am okay because uh, plus and minus, I invested in some business in the US. If you know about it privately, that is okay with me. I'm not looking for that much. To be able to take care of my kids and, and other immediate family members that I have to. And I'm okay. I've also, uh, you know, I own a security company with my, my yeah. brother in law in Takradi. So things are okay. For me, I'm not flamboyant, though I've brought some cars to Ghana before, if you know. At the time, there was none in Ghana here. And those are vanity. Why do you guys invest in such things? As in the cars, the cars and the kind of lifestyle, you know, expensive things. You know, uh, I see some of your colleagues. You know, you, yourself back in the day. You know, you're having all these big, 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 big cars and all of that. I mean, why were you guys investing in such things? I think the car is a minute part of whatever we get mm. <laughs> because, assuming you are making my time, then you take Ankara Guju for instance. I could be making at the time four hundred thousand dollars a year. So if I'm buying a car, twenty thousand worth, or thirty thousand worth, it was nothing. It, was, it wasn't any extraordinary. But that is what the people outside see. Mm -hmm. For me, the cars and you know, it's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. People see you outwardly driving a car, so they think that oh, you are wasting your money. But no, there are other things that family people will be coming to you, friends will be coming to you. Those areas, if you are able to cut down on those aspects of your spending, mm -hmm. I'm sure you are capable of. Is, is, it, is it difficult for you guys, I mean, footballers, to find proper true love? I'm asking this because sometimes you see the kind of women the footballers go for, yeah. and you have told yourself that, mm, had it not been for the money or for the fame, <laughs> would this girl be following this kind of person? I mean, is it difficult for you guys to find who true love really? You know, who is your true love? Let Let's me say. let me say this for the fun of it. My former captain, Sinapia, who is my junior brother, my colleague, he says, I am. You can say, yes, 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 And Fifi, me, I chose, I, or I got a very good woman. Wasn't with me because of August 9th for whatever. We started... And then we built up going forward. Even though I met her when we came back from Australia in 93. And for me, she wasn't there because of what I had. And she was supporting. But you could acknowledge that some of your, foot, your other colleagues... Of course. Most of the women come because of the elevation you've gotten by way of playing football. Mm. You want to enjoy that. But the moment they start dwindling, that's where you see their real characters. Mm. And so most of the women come for today. But they don't think about it. Well, tomorrow, when you are done with football and you are encountering certain difficulties, most of them move away. And I don't want to mention it. most of my colleagues, especially those who went to Belgium, Germany, one way or the other, some have divorced once, twice, because the women come along because at the time, and you know, some of... Is it, is it also not the character of the people, the, the players? No, no. Because, Fifi, if, let's say, a woman says her husband is cheating, that's how come she's also doing A, B, C, D. If the good book, which is the Bible, is there for us to believe, and the Quran is there to believe, where in the Bible do you say woman marry for? Where? It never, it never happened. It never happened. It's it's one's mentality. It's one person how, but... But the Quran says you can marry for. It's there. In the Quran. Even in the Bible. Mm. That, but you have to take care of them equally. Equally. Love them equally. Equally. The question is... Can, can you... I do that? I can't do it. So I'll prefer one. You so, prefer one with side chicks? No. I mean, as you grow, Fifi, you encounter a lot of things. Yeah. And when you grow to where I've got into, there are certain things that are not important. Yeah. Especially when I lost my wife, Barbara. And I sat back, I said, wow, really? Such is the world. And so it, it, it's rather educated me 
I grieved, but it gave me education. Mm. So there are certain things that me, I don't, I don't ask for, I don't even subscribe mm. to. Mm. But a woman should not take advantage of the fact that because I had my husband was chasing some women, so I'm also. But you're married to another beautiful woman now. Felicity. Yeah, very beautiful yes. woman, I know. And very understanding. Yeah. I, I remember when my wife died, I said, I will not marry again. I thought, I told myself, I will marry again. Because those times, there are certain things I did not understand her. So along the line, because I'm well into church, you go to church, you don't want to fool around and all that. So no, okay. I took counsel for one or two people. And then I met so You didn't want to marry again there. there, there I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Review her. Seriously, I said there, to myself, there, 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 review. if on the way, <laughs> Something crosses me and I slide. <laughs> that one I've fallen. That, that is that because because, had, you are, because you are a footballer. I had three boys and two girls, mm. and I thought it was okay for me. But then I met Felicity, and it's different. Felicity was not born in Ghana; she was born in Ivory Coast, a Ghanaian parent. But I think that maybe where she came from, and personally her own character orientation, orientation, and all that. She came to even learn. P, Fanti, and English in Ghana. When she came to Ghana, she was like 18, 19 years old. About. And I'm, I mean, God works in mysterious ways. So I am content. She's, she's a beautiful woman. She's a content, beautiful soul. Yeah. You have a beautiful heart. Yeah. I, I mean, we'll have to end up our conversation here. And I want to thank you, yeah. uh, you know, for coming and sharing your experiences here. If you could wind back the clock, yes. the things that you did, would you do them again? No. No. There's but, one thing I've done. Still, mm -hmm. There's one thing I've done that I've not regretted. Which is, at the time that all this crisis was ongoing, I had a very huge land that I invested in that I could have sold or whatever it was. But my wife, who's no more with us, said, ah, "Why don't you give this to the church?" At the time we were watching with the church, and then I said, "Oh, yeah, you've spoken of Arab. so we gave it to the church in a prime area." It's one thing I've done that I, I am content with. I, <laughs> I feel grateful for that opportunity. Because when I go into that church, what excites me is when I see people there praying to God, yeah. putting their requests yeah. before him. And would, you, would you be a pastor one day? Who knows? Seem to be like you are already. Yeah, who knows? Well, yeah. you can never say no. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, for yesterday, like that, uh, a pastor friend was there. Hey. If you want to see here now, also, you know, about Ted Bond, no, yes, Grace, I want to know it's more than me. He's a prophet, he says, he's more than me, and it's not only him who said that. A lot of people, would you go into coaching? I am a coach, really. yes, I know you are, mm. uh, you are but to coach physically, yeah. like, yeah, maybe, maybe, why not? I've said, never, 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 never said, yeah, like why not? But there are a lot of things that you know privately yeah. that I have not even bothered going in there. Because coaches in this country are not allowed to work, to work, and to do what technically they've been taught to do. If and you are to rate the GFA currently, that Kato Kiko's administration, how would you rate them from zero to ten? What would it matter? I think there are areas that they've done well. I think to promote the league and all, and there are areas that they need to improve, especially in terms of communication. When Augusta Info speaks, the response from the FA almost immediately sometimes. Should not be it. So if you're marking them over 10, maybe I'll give them seven. Seven over 10. Would you stand for FA president one day? Once again, never, never say never. Say never. <laughs> <laughs> Augustine, thank you so much for coming thank on the you. show. Right. So we've been talking to Augustine Ahinfo. Um, he had a name, Kakura Mo. <laughs> yeah, he had a name, Kakura Mo. He went to Cote d'Ivoire back in the day and they gave him that name, Kakura Mo. You know, uh, one of the. Kakura Mo is just a Ghanaian. Is that, yeah. Kweku Raymond. Raymond. So, uh, but in pronouncing it in French, Kaku. Kakura Mo. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Augustine, for coming on the show. We wish you all the I very best you. and I hope to see you at the very, very, very top of life after football. So, we're, we're going to give you more of such interviews right here on 50 Bands on TV. All you have to do is subscribe, press the red button right on the right side of your screen right now, and you'll be getting notifications on some of the content that we put on this channel. Let me also remind you that there's something called Escapades. Escapades. It's one of the most beautiful series um, that you're going to see 
um, on this channel and we're going to tell you on which day escapades will be showing so you could catch up that story it's a beautiful story that will be hitting your screens every week on this channel all right so thank you so much for watching thank you so much for being a part of it there's another love tale story that will come again right on the show my name is fifi banter have a beautiful time